So let's pray together. God, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for all that you've done for us. And just ask that you be at work in our hearts and in our minds right now. Uh, be at work in these words, that they uh, might come to us as your words. Lord, we pray that, uh, that I might not get in the way of those words, but that you might uh, speak something that you have to say uh, to this congregation this morning. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. It was one of those moments that really makes a pastor wince. I remember it was just before choir practice, uh, one Thursday night in the church, the first church that I served. And I was talking through the hymns with our organist. She was a volunteer who had been there, uh, I think, better than 50 years at that point. She'd been playing the organ at this church. And I loved her very much, and everybody loved her. She's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful woman. And when I said I'd like to sing number 378, she looked it up. She said, ah, yes, amazing grace. And then she turned to me, and very seriously, she, she looked me right in the face and said, Joe, can you tell me what is grace exactly anyway? And I felt awful. I mean, here is a woman who's been playing this song for better than 50 years, probably has played it hundreds of times, and really didn't know what it meant. Now, that's not to say that she didn't know how to live it out and that she didn't know in her soul what that meant, because I know that she did. But she would never learned how to articulate what is grace. It's the most important of all Christian concepts, if you ask me. In that moment, I felt like the church had really let Carol down. So let's start with the definition. Grace is the love and favor of God at work in us, even though we do not deserve it. And it's an idea that's very closely related to mercy. It's kind of the flip side of mercy. So if mercy is when we don't get the punishment that we do deserve, grace is when we get the blessing that we don't deserve. So one way that people frequently talk about salvation is the idea that we are all sinners saved by grace. In other words, we're forgiven even though we don't really deserve it. Forgiveness through the cross of Jesus Christ is a blessing that God gives us freely, and that's grace. Which brings us to the story. And I do mean the story. I don't believe that there's ever been any story ever told, whether before or since, with as much power as this one to change us. It's a story about grace. It's a story about seeking grace. It's a story about offering grace. It's a story about rejecting grace. The broad outlines of it are familiar to you, but I don't think you can preach it and just not tell it. So there's a man who has two sons. And the younger son asks for his share of the inheritance early. And he says, I'm going to get out of this one donkey town and go see the world. And his father, with tears in his eyes, hands over the money. Now, being a young man who likes to have a good time, he spends through his cash a lot quicker than he thought that he would. And he finds himself trying to make ends meet by working on some Gentile's pig farm. Now for a Jew to work on a pig farm. It's the lowest of the low. And finally, there comes a day when he says, this is ridiculous. I'm hungry. I'm homeless. I don't even eat bacon. I'm going home. Even my father's servants have it much better than I do right now. So he decides that he's going to go home and ask for a place on dad's farm as a servant. He even has this great speech worked up. Here's what I'll say to dad when I get there. But the thing is, he never actually gets to say it. By the time he gets there, dad sees him coming and runs out and greets him and throws his arms around him and says, son, I knew you'd come back. And then dad calls for all the good things in the house to be brought out. Fancy robe, sandals, a ring, just the finest of everything. 
And dad turns to the servants and says, tonight we'll feast. This son of mine, he was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and now he's found. We hear the story and we say, yes, I recognize that. That is the gospel, right? That is gospel. Every human being needs to know this good news, that we are accepted just as we are. We are loved no matter what it is that we've done. And that God's love for us is unconditional. And so, of course, grace, coming back to the theme of this series, is a word that will change our lives. To know that we are beloved, to know that we are forgiven no matter what. Knowing that this is who God is, that changes us. How many of us have seen ourselves in this story in some way? Far away from God, wandering on our own having burned our bridges and squandered our inheritance. And yet, Jesus says to us, I'm not through with you yet. I'm not done with you. So grace is a word that will change our lives if we let it. It will change us because it undermines everything that we believe about how the world works. It breaks the cycle of sin. It breaks the cycle of pain and vengeance and introduces something that's brand new. So no longer is the story, you hurt me, so I'm going to hurt you back. That's the story of the world. But the Christian story is very different. The story that we tell goes like this. You hurt me, but I'm going to love you anyway. That's the story that we tell. So one way to talk about grace is to say that it's the benefit of the doubt that we would hope someone would extend to us if we were in the same situation. How would we want our parents to react if we hit 18, got into trouble, set out on our own, and then found ourselves broke and homeless? How would we want our parents to react? Wouldn't we want a second chance? One of the things that's funny about this parable is our reaction is highly dependent on where we are in the birth order in our family, right? So I am the youngest. I love this story, right? I love this story. I've met firstborns. How many are firstborns? Just a couple. Oh. I've met firstborns who think the dad in this story is an idiot. So let's talk for a minute about the older brother. He's outside in the field when his younger brother returns. And he hears this music, and he hears this dancing, and naturally he asks, what's going on? And one of the servants answers, your brother's home. Your father is thrilled to have him back safe and sound. So tonight we're having a feast in his honor. The older brother gets so angry that he won't even go into the house. And finally dad comes out and says, what's wrong? All this, all this is wrong. Your son breaks up the estate, He goes off and spends your money on God knows what, and then you give him a hero's welcome. Seriously. I've been busting my hump for you all these years, and not even once did you give me a goat, much less prime rib. And the older brother does have a point. And this is one of the things about grace, and one of the things that's amazing about grace. The fact that we can come in here every Sunday and preach grace. Grace is pretty offensive. It's deeply offensive. What Jesus is suggesting with his story sounds a lot like anarchy. It really does. Do you forgive the repentant murderer? Do you allow people who cross the border illegally to stay? How about the guy who blindsided you in that meeting with your boss last week? because he wants your job. Do you just let that slide? Grace is deeply offensive. Often it's deeply offensive to our sense of right and wrong, to our sense of what's just and what's proper. It offends our sense of propriety. It's kind of like giving a free pass to someone you know does not deserve it. It seems like allowing someone to make poor choices and then not live with the consequences. 
And that's why the number one son is so angry. What good is it for anyone to try to play by the rules when in the end, you're going to do what you want anyway? That's what number one son is saying. What's the point? Why have I stayed here all this time? Why have I been working for you like a dog? Why have I been doing that? So this is the other way in which grace is life-changing. It's not only life-changing because we know that we are accepted. It's life-changing because it causes us to wrestle with the fact that the universe is governed by a being who seems to enjoy doing things that mess with our sense of what's right and what's wrong. Everything about this story speaks to that. The father running out to meet son number two. That is something that would not have happened in the ancient Near East. That was a shameful thing for a man to run. And an even more shameful thing for a man to run out to greet a rebellious son. Deeply shameful. Or how about at the end of the story, for the father to go out and to talk to son number one who refuses to come in. There are passages of what we call the deuterocanonical scriptures, scriptures that uh, were, part of the, were part of the Bible at one point and then were set aside later that extol the virtues of beating rebellious children. And here the father goes outside and speaks to his son gently to say, I wish you would come in and join us. Jesus, in his time on the earth, loved to plant these little, I don't know what to call them except grace bombs. That's really what they were, wherever he went. Maybe tonight I'll go and eat some dinner with some tax collectors. Wow, this woman's caught in adultery? How about we not stone her for once? Jesus' stories all tell us that God is not always who we expect God to be. And that sometimes grace just does not seem to make sense to us at all. But then maybe it does. Because we step back from it and we say, well, didn't Jesus say love your neighbor as yourself? Doesn't that mean that we would want to give others the same benefit of the doubt that we would want to be given if we were in the same situation? Grace is this life-changing word because it forces us to wrestle with the question of how it is that we can bless others day in and day out. How can we bless them? Whether, we, whether they deserve it or not. I mean, do we really need to be the strict enforcer of the 15 items or less rule with that person in front of us in line at the grocery store? Is that our job, really? Can't we just let that snarky remark, maybe from our sister or our brother or our sister-in-law or brother-in-law, why can't we just let that go instead of getting all huffy about it? Can't we find it within us to consider forgiving someone even though they've hurt us very deeply? Grace all starts with God, and it all starts as a gift. It comes to us as something, something that we just can't control. It comes to us as something that wants to be given away. That's the nature of grace. It's like trying to hold water in your hands. You can't. It wants to go. It wants to flow out. Grace is the word this week because the more that we learn to give it away, the more like God we become. Amen?